You know, one of the reasons Jesse Ventura is among my very favorite guests is because he says what has to be said. And he doesn't cower to his critics or people who oppose him. And when you hear what he's about to say, it's not coming from the Republican or Democratic brand name attached to it. It's him looking out for this country. His latest book, Demo Crips and Rebloodlicans, No More Gangs in Government. And it rolled off my uh, lips a little easier that time. I've been having trouble pronouncing it. Great to have you back on the show, man. Well, thanks, Alan. Yeah, the one they always stumble over is re-blood-licking. That's it's right. The, the way you need to do is break it down. re blood lickens. Yeah. And then you get it right. No, you're not alone. A whole bunch of people kind of stumble over re blood lickens. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, it's a great title. And as I said in the introduction, you uh, it's, it's interesting, the brand name aspect. You bring it up in Chapter 1 about the brand name. In fact, right from the get-go... The reason for the title. So let's start right there. Well, the reason for the title is that uh, if you look at these two, okay, if we look at our political, what's a blue state? That's a Democratic state. What's a red state? That's a Republican state. Well, ironically, those are the two colors of the street gangs. The, the Crips are blue and the Bloods are naturally are red. So they incorporate the same color code as the street gangs do. Yeah. Absolutely. I never even thought of it that way. I, I don't know if it's coincidence, but it's, cer- it's certainly is something to think about. It's accurate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is accurate. And I think, and this is something that is just mind-boggling. As I look at what you're doing, whether it's uh, from any of your books, you're trying to wake people up. And, and, and I think what's happening, you're facing uh, a society that, for the most part, has a couple of decades of misinformation part of their psyche and you have to dismantle that yeah well the problem is and i hate to say it the media oh yeah you know when you when you look at today's world you know i had the good fortune of hearing dan rather the other day talk and dan rather talked about remember when he got fired for reporting on george bush's military record yes it was true and that's astounding In other words, if you report the truth, you can lose your job. Well, the big point rather made beyond that was that 20 years ago, there were probably better than 40 outlets of the news. Well, due to the corporate takeover and what's happening within the corporate world, today you have basically four corporations that control everything you hear and see on radio and television. And if they don't control it by, you know, directly saying you will deal with this subject, you won't deal with this subject, they certainly set the uh, groundwork for intimidation sometimes when sponsors and they know when they ruffle feathers that there's problems. And so just by the mere staying, keeping your job, the mere business of broadcasting, sometimes they're caving in without directly being told what to do. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Alan. You know you know what caused the downfall of the media? What's that? The show 60 Minutes. Let me explain. Okay. 60 Minutes is a marvelous show. But prior to 60 Minutes, all the news was expected to lose money. All they were was to get information and give it to the public. And all the corporations would make it up in their entertainment department. They expected to lose money. Then along came 60 Minutes. Boom, it shot the number one in the ratings. Well, the light went off with the bean counters. Wait, you mean we can make money with the news? So at that point, it became the news started to be created rather than reported. And when you start creating the news, that's dangerous. See, the news today is all about ratings and money. Mm -hmm. And in the old days, it was not. It was simply to inform the public and make them educated. And they made up for it, as I said, in their entertainment divisions. But now it's about money and ratings, and that's dangerous. That's why you've got all these opinionated, alleged news shows on TV. They're not news. They're opinion. They're editorial. They're the host's opinion and all of that stuff. It's not straight, hardcore news. And to give you another example, look at, okay, I love I love to talk and put it in a perspective of, of look at what dominated us a couple years headlines every single day for 30 days the death of Anna Nicole Smith remember that sure 
Now, how is that newsworthy to me? I didn't know her. Flash it up one day and be done with it. They were sending mobile units, satellite units, down to the hotel she died in. Big stories on who's going to get control of her son and all this nonsense. Yes, it's a tragedy she died. And then I'll piggyback that a little bit on a bit for drugs. You know, I find it very interesting, and I'm stealing from Bill Maher here. Mm -hmm. The Beatles... Took, admitted they took LSD when they wrote Sgt. Pepper. They were all on LSD. Well, Sgt. Pepper's arguably one of the greatest rock albums ever written. Absolutely. Okay? Anna and Nicole Smith took six medical prescription drugs and couldn't even dial 911 to save her life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it, the discrepancy in the drug war and, and what drugs are uh, tolerated and for what reason and, and the one drug, marijuana that can do some good all the medical research all the latest research you know this we've talked about it before it supports that it may have amazing benefits it may even have cancer suppressing uh uh, benefits well well, and the other thing they determine you know how they tell you that you lose your memory on pot how they've now discovered that's not true that it that it actually helps alzheimer patients Yes, it's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. It yeah. almost yeah. sounds like yeah. when when you say these things, uh, people who oppose the idea, if they still, first of all, it's rare to find people who still oppose it. But if you find people who still oppose the idea of decriminalizing it, they just think it's too good to be true. And all these people just want to get high and we're throwing these things out there just to uh, legalize it just for fun. Let me add one more thing. Yes, we're, we're in a fuel crisis, right? Right. Guess what makes the best biodiesel fuel on the planet? Hemp. Marijuana and hemp. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if we would allow that to be grown and used, we could then take corn and put it back to its original use, food. When, you know, I was going to come up with, I was going to talk about the drug war in a bit, so that, well, since we brought it up, we'll just do one or more, two things, and I sure, want people to... Oh, yeah, we are going to be definitely talking about specific things, and it's going to blow you away. This book uh, is could be the my favorite of all your books because you really hit it on the head. And when you give the facts and the stats, you can Google it, you can search it, you know it's been verified. You're, it's going to scare you. Oh, yeah. Well, it's like I tell people, I urge people, please read this book because then if you vote for a Democrat or Republican, you're at fault. Because if anyone reads this book and can still in good conscience vote for someone from these two parties, they deserve what they get, and, and uh, it's ridiculous. I, I'm already promoting hard since Ron Paul appears to be leaving the race. Right. I can't urge enough people. You know, Congress has about a 10% approval rating. Well, I urge the other 90% out there, you want to strike out against government, you want to show your dissatisfaction, then vote for the Libertarian candidate governor, Gary Johnson of New Mexico. He was a governor when I was governor of Minnesota. He's a wonderful man. He got hard railed out of the Republican Party because why? He was moderate. Mm -hmm. He's also for drug legalization. You know, end this crazy stuff. And, and so people have the opportunity this election, and if, if, even if Gary Johnson can get 20% of the vote if he doesn't win, mm-hmm. it'll, it'll send shockwaves through the system. And don't believe the mainstream media. I went into it today on Fox when I did Fox Business. They sit and say to me, he can't win. Well, I got news for you. Mainstream media said the same thing when I ran. They told the That's public, right. Jesse That's right. Ventura cannot win. Yep. And lo and behold, I won. Why do you think mainstream media hated me so bad? I turned them into liars. Well, they also have to realize that in recent history, social media, without Fox News, CNN, and MSNBC, just social media alone has changed the course of what was inevitable, like the uh, SOPA uh, regulations. You know, all these things happen because of social media. So it is possible. Yep. It is possible. The... um, Okay. Oh, well, since you brought up Ron Paul, I, you know, I, I was a little, what do you think the problem was for Ron? Is it because during debates he didn't perform well? What do you think it is? No, he didn't get any media coverage. I mean, in the first Iowa caucus, he finished an eyelash behind Michelle Bachman. Mm-hmm. They didn't even mention his name. They talked to, uh, more about Gary Santorum or whatever his name was, who ended up getting like 3% there. 
No, they, they, the, the, the mainstream media wouldn't touch Ron Paul. And, and so they kept quiet. Ron Paul placed in the top three in virtually almost every one of them. He won Minnesota hands down by a landslide. And he generated the youth culture. That is so hard to do. Yes, I did it too. Yes, you did. The youth came out in Minnesota when I ran beyond belief. There is one ray of hope out there, and it's going to happen. In Maine, many people don't realize. When I was an independent governor, I had one colleague, Governor Angus King of Maine, was also independent. And ironically, Maine and Minnesota always lead the nation in percentage of voter turnout. And uh, Angus went back to the private sector for about seven or eight years now. He's now running for, I think, Olympia Snow held the Senate seat. Angus is running for it, and the polls have him so far ahead of the Democrats and Republicans, it's laughable. So there will be a new independent senator coming from Maine, I believe. All right, when we come back, I want to talk about specifics from the book. Sure. Very interesting stuff, and, and I'm just going to let you go and speak your mind. Thanks. By the way, the website, we ain't got time to bleed.com. We ain't got time to bleed.com. The new book, Democrats and Rebloodlicans, No More Gangs in Government. Okay, we're just going to keep rolling here. Okay. The, the commercials will all be edited in. Uh, okay, here we go. Stand sure. by. Jesse Ventura says, political parties are just thugs in Brook Brothers suits. His new book, Democrips and Rebloodlicans, it's out. And again, Jesse speaking his mind, and it's just... Uh, uh, always fun to hear you on the radio. And it's also fun because what you're saying, so few people have the guts to say so. All right, let's, let's just take some of the headlines from your book, and then we'll get into some specifics. I'm just going to give it to you. Just go with it. Government salaries, health care, and retirement benefits. Talk about the average American versus members of Congress. Well, first of all, of course, they go in, not all of them go in as millionaires, but you notice they all come out as millionaires. How can that be when they're only paid, you know, a hundred and some thousand a year to be a congressman? Well, because they're allowed to participate in insider trading, something that we go to jail for. Mm -hmm. The average return a congressman gets on his investments is 12%. That's higher than Warren Buffett gets. And so, and again, we go to jail. If we do that, we go to jail, they get to do it. And there's no way you can prove it because it's all hidden under layers of oh, yeah. what? Yeah. And they're not going to prosecute themselves. They never do. All they do, they censure each other. I used to love that. He got censured. Mm -hmm. Well, what's that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, what kind of penalty is that? Uh, so that's how the wealth works. Now let's go to health care. You hear John Boehner and all them griping Obamacare, get rid of it, blah, blah, blah. Government shouldn't have government-run health care. What do you think all of them have? Yeah. Government-run health care. In fact, as we researched, they get five options, Alan. They get five health care options they can choose from. And one of the, why didn't one of these people say, listen, I don't, I think one actually, there was a, a Democrat, can't recall his name, I think right here in North Carolina. He says, I'm not taking my health care. Uh, I, I just don't think it's necessary. And I don't think the government should be doing this if we're not, you know. And I'd like to see some of these people who are so against President Obama's uh, health care plan and any kind of, I guess, change of the, the status quo. I'd like to see one of these people say, well, you know what? Why should we take this when the people, we don't want the people to have a government plan. Why should we? Exactly. My belief is this. In a country as rich as us, if we weren't involved in these stupid wars and all the overseas nonsense that we're involved in, we would have more money for health care than you could imagine. But in a rich country like ours, how can an industrial, we're the only industrialized nation where everyone's not covered. Mm -hmm. Everybody in this country, when they get sick, should have the ability to go to the doctor. And, and it's absurd, you know. And then, okay, let's move. You want, do you want term limits without implementing them? Yeah. I'll tell you how. Take away retirement. Why should you get a retirement for public service? 
Yeah, really, if you think about it, especially in this day and age, the, the, the retirement is gone. Pensions are gone for the most part. Oh, yeah, but they get them, and yeah. they only got to serve a term or two, and they get a full retirement. Yeah. And you know what's interesting about it? I list in the book, 20 of them are convicted felons, and they still get their retirement. You can break the law and be convicted of a felony, and you still will get your government retirement if you're a congressman or senator. A record 45 million Americans now living on food stamps. And, uh, of course, uh, Donald Trump saying that uh, Obama is the food stamp president. Talk about that. And also, as you said, the financial situation we're in, the economic problems started with overspending. And this goes to the war. This is things that, well, both parties are responsible for. They always are both parties responsible for it. And how can they make an excuse They've been in charge for over 100 years, and yet they'll try to blame us. Get this, Alan. This last big recession, depression that we're still in right now, Mm -hmm. 99% of us have lost wealth. Me included, you, all of us, in some manner. Our houses were devalued if we owned them, whatever it may be. But get this. The richest rich have increased their wealth five times during this recession. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you were worth $20 billion, you're now worth $100 billion. Now, that shows me that they orchestrate these recessions. That they don't just happen, it's done with a purpose. It's done so the ultra-rich get even richer. And I sit back and go, somebody worth $30 billion, why would you need more money? You couldn't even begin to spend that in your your lifetime, your children's lifetime, or your grandchildren's lifetime. To show you how much things have changed, if the facts about those facts you just heard Jesse talk about were out on a table maybe 25 years ago when we had investigative reporting and we had people who were definitely trying to be fair to both sides and truly, you know, not not biased, there were those people. I think the public overwhelmingly would see the logic and be outraged. Today, you have people in the lower economic uh, ranks who are supporting this whole idea to support the rich. It's almost as if they don't know what they're doing or if they they think this is somehow going to help them. I don't know. Well, what's interesting, remember this, that, that fact I just gave you about the, you know, the ultra-wealthy have increased right. by five times. Well, guess what? I did an interview with Forbes magazine, mm-hmm. and they backed me up. It says Ventura's 304-page book, again, rant, blah, 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 and it talks about how Americans lost their net worth and saw their incomes decline while the richest saw it increase. They followed it up. That's a fact. Earlier this year, City Private Bank and Knight Frank released their 2012 wealth report. Guess what? They said the exact same thing as Jesse Ventura. High net worth individuals around the world saw their net worth on average go up, while the rest of the riffraff saw their net worth go down. Jesse, what I want to talk about now is, as we switch from subject to subject, although we sure. will come back to these things, the uh, this is something, a misconception that just grates on my nerves when so many people are unemployed and those who have personal bankruptcies overwhelmingly have it because of medical bills, even if they have insurance and the medical bills can put people under. Yep. But yet there's this disparaging attitude towards people for having a personal bankruptcy as if it was their failure. And this is ingrained in society. Talk about that. Well, uh, I'm glad you brought up medical. Because take a look at what the CEOs of all these medical providers are making. I list it all in my book. Right. Millions and, you know, $200 million the head of whatever, medical or whatever made. I'm not quoting anyone here. I'd have to find the page. Right. But trust me, these people are raping and pillaging. They're getting wealthy beyond belief, while most of us, our medical has gone up like 38% what we have to pay in medical care. Well, where's it going? It's going right in the CEO's back pocket. You're not getting better medical care. You're getting raped and pillaged so that these people, again, can become wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. From your book, according to a story in the Los Angeles Times, leaders of uh, Cigna, Humana, United Health, WellPoint, and Aetna received nearly $200 million in compensation in 2009 
while the companies sought rate increases as high as 39%. Prime example, Cigna CEO Edward Henry, uh, the successor to David Cortani, $136.3 million in 2009. Wow. Yeah. And yet people are griping if an illegal immigrant goes to the emergency room if he's bleeding to death. <laughs> well, I, I actually hear people... Wait, people need to remember we're all human beings. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, and if someone's hurt or sick, why do you need to know whether they're here legally or not? That's a human being. Have some compassion. As we get, and absolutely agree with you on that, because I sometimes when we talk about healthcare, I hear people say, "Well, you, anybody can go into the emergency room, and, and so we, they have healthcare. We don't need to do anything else." Well, that's costing us more, much more in the long run because we have to pay those bills. Hugely. If you go to the emergency room rather than your own doctor, it's like triple yeah. the, the expense there. Where if you to do preventative medicine, you go to your doctor, he can help you out at that point, and you don't have to go to the emergency room. It's much, much cheaper. As we get into the election year, two serious issues. First thing I want to talk about is the Supreme Court decision. And the super PACs and religion and lobbyists, just take it, uh, explain it, because, boy, you really hit it on the head. Well, you know, what you've got now, the Supreme Court rules that corporations are individuals. The Supreme Court rules that money is free speech. I always like to say this. I'm waiting for the next bank robber to use as his defense in court. Hey, I was just practicing my free speech rights. You know, when I robbed the bank, it's, mm-hmm. after all, money's free speech. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, of course, I'm being facetious there, but the point of the matter is, how, how could our Supreme Court, well, clearly they're controlled too now. Clearly they've fallen victim to uh, the corporate takeover of this country. And people need to understand the basic definition of fascism. That's what it is. When corporations team with organized religion to control the government, we're already there. I've said it before, we're the fascist states of America, not the United States of America. And people who hear that, oh, he hates America, though, he says we're I fascist. No, no, I know, I know, I know. But it, but the, the logic of some of the opponents who hear this, not realizing what you're saying is because you love this country. Well, remember, Thomas Jefferson said dissension's the greatest form of patriotism. Sure. And, and I believe that strongly. If you don't hold your elected officials' feet to the fire, you're going to get bad government. You know what else people need to wake up to in this country, Alan? What? We're their boss. They're not our boss. Yeah. This country, we're supposed to be the boss. They're supposed to work for us, not the other way around. Somehow they flip-flopped it today, and they think we're here to work for them. Those super PACs that we're talking about, give an idea of just how much money we're talking about. Coke Industries certainly funded the Tea Party a great deal. What, $55 million? Oh, it's, it's, it's absurd. No, no, the $55 million was actually, uh, they used uh, uh, to get scientists to say global warming is a hoax. Yeah, they paid off scientists to lie. Wow. To tell us that it was a hoax. The, you know, the scientists took the money instead of telling the truth. They were bought off which seems to be bribery, seems to be the prevailing process of our country today. It buys off our politicians, it buys off our scientists, it buys off everything. And until we can somehow break away from that, we're going down the wrong road and we're going down it fast. When we come back, I want to talk about uh, your feelings about President Obama. And again, as we get ready for the election, this is always been scary for me and i'm really worried it's the rigging of the electronic voting machines it's jesse ventura it's an incredible book democrats and rebloodlicans no more gangs in government okay stand by jesse ventura is with us as usual saying things that just needs to be said out of his brand new book, Democrips and Rebloodlicans, No More Gangs in Government. He has a great website, and uh, it's a website that he actually started when uh, he had his last book out, We Ain't Got Time to Bleed.com, the official site, We Ain't Got Time to Bleed.com. The voting machine issue is really 
serious. And I think it seems to me when you listen to talk radio, if it's a Republican president who is running, uh, then anybody who says there's some rigging of the voting machines, they just think, well, they're just sour grapes. Then if it's a now that a uh, Democrat's in office, uh, Republicans are going to be saying that it's Democrats who are rigging the machine. So here we go. Two parties again. Well, give me your view on all this. Well, first of all, we need to go back to the basic ballot, the, the ballot where you fill in the little dot with a pencil. Paper, yeah. Paper. paper. Yeah. The reason being is, first of all, anyone who's incapable of doing that shouldn't vote anyway. You've been taking tests since first grade. Remember in first grade, you had to fill in the little circle? Mm -hmm. Well, come on. Who can't do that? And the other simple way to put it, these electronic voting machines can be hijacked just like any computer. And the, uh, the, the, the simple way of putting it is this way, Alan. Would you go to an ATM machine that didn't offer you a receipt? Nope. Never. Well, these electronic voting machines don't offer you a receipt. If you poor say you're going to vote for Barack Obama... In fact, I'll get him out of there. In fact, I'll, I'll say who I'm voting for. When I go in an electronic voting machine and I'm going to vote for Governor Gary Johnson, mm -hmm. the, the libertarian candidate for president, I have no idea with an electronic voting machine if my vote was cast correctly. Even if you get a receipt. Even if you get a receipt, you really don't know what's going on. Yeah, you don't know. And the, thing, and the thing is, with everybody, especially older people confused with computers to begin with, and how things lock up and they're not perfect. I don't understand. I, I would, if you don't have a backup system that's purely paper, I agree with you. Let's either ditch this whole idea. It's just making money for these corporations. The other system worked just fine. It's oh, yeah. And, and you can have a recount. Yeah. These electronic voting machines give you a receipt like an adding machine. It says, okay, candidate A got 5,320 votes, candidate B got 4,000-something. You can't individually count them. So you have no idea if the adding machine has been messed with or not or been hacked. And I believe that happened both in the 2000 and 2004 elections to put George Bush over the top. Because Diebold, this company... Diebold, yeah, Diebold, yeah, yeah. They were a heavy contributor to the Republican Party. And all the votes in, the, in those swing states of Ohio got sent to Chattanooga, Tennessee there first before they were officially sent back to Ohio. And by the way, the, the whistleblower who was going to rat him out mm -hmm. amazingly died in a private airplane crash a couple of days before he was subpoenaed in front of Congress. Oh, God. You know, and I remember when that whole thing was going down, some of the comments coming from the uh, owner of the company or one of the big uh, whoever, I don't know, I can't, I wish I had it, but I remember the, the essence of the comment was something like, well, President Bush is definitely going to win. And, uh, you know, it was, it was one of these things that looked like he would do anything to make that happen or something like that. It, oh, absolutely. You know, and, and don't, and don't think, that the that the Democrats would be any different. Yeah, They'd talk do, about do that. If they could talk about that, and and talk about uh, you know you're not supporting President Obama. What's your feelings on President Obama? Well, you know, I, I we used a, Dick and I used a clever title of our chapter on President Obama. We uh, we entitled it uh, the Obama Administration Spare Change You Can Believe In, <laughs> and uh, I I'm so disappointed because. When he talked about change we can believe in, I don't see one bit of change between him and George Bush other than the color of their skin. I mean, the way they've governed, Obama now is raiding the medicinal marijuana places and trying to put them out of business, tax them out any way they can. Well, of course, that's the drug corporations talking. They don't want you taking something that you can grow in your backyard and heal yourself when they've got pills to sell you. And I wonder if he's doing that because he feels that this is uh, something that he needs to do to win conservatives because it doesn't sound like what he's talked about in the past. Well, I think it's done more with the money. You know, big, big campaign contributions. You got to do what those money people want you to do. You know, I have to laugh. Obama does a speech railing on Wall Street. And then his biggest contributor is Goldman Sachs. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, come on. 
that's simply lip service when behind the scenes you're being bribed and you're going to do whatever the briber wants you to do. You know, I have a theory. And and as far as the drug war, and I know Ron Paul, of course, is a Republican, but it, it, until a conservative Republican that conservatives and talk show hosts who are conservative love, until one of those people comes out and says it's time to legalize marijuana and decriminalize it, I don't think it's ever going to happen because it's only going to be a Republican who could say that that immediately would get the support of the right-wingers who right now, the hard right who's against it, they they kill any Democrat who brings it up. Look what they did to Clinton. I think it's going to take a a right-wing conservative to ever get it done in our lifetime. Jesse, what do you think? Well, I find it very ironic that Rush Limbaugh, who for years has been the spokesman of the far right, he made the statement that all drug addicts belong in prison. I remember. He hasn't put himself in prison. I remember I got audio of that. and I've got audio when he was doing his TV show talking about all the uh, people who need medicinal marijuana, uh, just saying just disparaging things about these cancer people. Uh, it's just, it blows my mind. You well, know. to me, what right does the government, if you have cancer, and I'll, I'll give you a personal story. Governor Tim Pawlenty of Minnesota, uh, the legislature here a number of years ago passed medicinal marijuana so it could be administered by a doctor. Mm-hmm. Well, Palenti had national aspirations as a Republican, so he, of course, vetoed it. Well, one of my wife and I, in fact, it's my one of my wife's best friends, came down with breast cancer. She went in for chemotherapy. It was horrid. She had to go out and illegally buy marijuana, and when she did, the chemotherapy was, was tolerable. That's she right. could get through it because she could eat. Yeah. You know, it makes you, it allows you to eat. That's the big thing about chemotherapy. You can't eat. Right. Well, how are you going to fend off a disease if you're not getting proper nutrition? Absolutely. I, and I've talked to many people who have gone through this, and, and it just tears me up. I mean, one of the reasons I'm committed to dealing with this subject on a, a routine basis whenever there's news, and I've been doing it for over 30 years, taking this very serious. Uh, it's because of those cases where it's it's just I can't let this continue, and I'm trying to do my little part in my little way to get the truth out there. And you know, I'm I get criticized. I there are other uh, talk show hosts, one I used to work with, who would make fun of me uh, dealing with this subject as if it was a Cheech and Chong movie, and uh, not even getting the seriousness of what I'm saying. Yeah. So you know, it's like. It's one of those things that's so ingrained in society. It's going to take someone like you to jolt people. Well, let's remember something. The Beatles admitted that they took LSD when they wrote Sgt. Pepper, right? Yeah. They admitted it, and they created one of the greatest rock albums, arguably, in history, okay? Anna Nicole Smith took six prescription legal drugs, and she couldn't even dial 911. Exactly. As you said before, that to, to me, that it's just uh, the, the prescription drugs are the big problem. And as more people figure how to not get busted by abusing other type of drugs that are illegal, well, things are worse. If they just let pot well, out in the first place, they're probably the pushers and the people who are selling the other drugs wouldn't have a market because people wouldn't deal with them if they could grow it themselves. Well, and, and the bottom line comes to personal freedom. If you, if, okay, if someone's on drugs and they rob the bank, well, then fine, prosecute him for rob the bank. I don't care what motivated them to do it. But if you want to take, why does the government feel you as an individual don't have the right in the privacy of your own home to do what you want? Usually what they say. Usually anyone else. That's right. They have no right to tell you. If someone wants in their privacy of their own home, to take LSD, and I'll add, I have never taken it. I don't know what it, you know, what it does. I've never done it. I've certainly smoked pot, and I know. And I'll state this: marijuana is far, far less harmful than alcohol. Oh, absolutely. I've never met no one that smokes a joint and punches out their wife. No, I mean, there's so that argument where they're talking about uh, alcohol is fine if you do it in moderation. They won't even extend that argument for marijuana. You're absolutely right. Comparing the two, there's no comparison. You you can't overdose marijuana. It can't be done. 
where alcohol, you can die of alcohol poisoning, you can throw up in the night and kill yourself on your own vomit. That's what they said killed Jimi Hendrix. Oh, sure, sure. It wasn't LSD, it wasn't any of that, it was alcohol Absolutely. that killed Jimi Hendrix. Absolutely, and, I, and, and you know, for the other side, one of the things I hear, because I always have the other side on the show, whether it's uh, law enforcement, but what they'll say to what you just said and I just said is, Alan, you just haven't seen what I've seen. I've seen uh, drugs uh, ruin families. And, of course, they throw drugs in there. And I'm talking marijuana, first of all. And, and, and they're talking about how it ruins families. It does do damage. It's not benign. Don't say it's benign. That, that, that's, that's their side. It ruins families. Well, you know why it's their side? That's their job. Yeah. yeah. They're out there. They're law enforcement. they got to bust people for something. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. Know? And, and let me tie into that. Today, all our prisons are now being turned over to the private sector, which everyone says, oh, that's great. Government's too big. We don't want government, private sector. Well, guess what? Corporations now run prisons, and they need a minimum of an 80% occupancy rate to be profitable. Yeah. So therefore, it's imperative that you go to jail so the corporations can keep their occupancy rate high and they can make a profit. I've also now, that is so dangerous, it's ridiculous. I've heard from people in law enforcement that the forfeiture laws where they can get all that property is money that they build buildings, they need that money to take take homes over and take boats and property if they find any drugs in the house. That money is helping build uh, new police stations. Whatever, but I mean, it's it, it to me is horrible. Uh, our constitutional rights, our Bill of Rights, has been shredded today. Uh, you you know about my court case, don't you? With the, uh, uh, With the TSA, and yeah, yes. Security? Uh, uh, let's talk about that. Yes. Okay, I sued because I have metal in my body. So when I go to any airport, the metal detector is going to go off. I could go through naked, and it's going to go off. Well. I'm then subjected either to the x-ray machine or the, the sexual assault. I had had enough of it. So I sued Homeland Security and the TSA for my Fourth Amendment rights, reasonable search and seizure. And the key word is reasonable. Right. What I was saying was it is not reasonable to believe Jesse Ventura is a threat. I've been a mayor. I've been a governor. I'm an honorably discharged Navy veteran. And I've been flying for 30 years in my career. I spent $20,000. It got to court because we were prepared to go to trial, me and my attorneys. It got in front of the federal judge, and she threw it out, stating she did not have jurisdiction. Hmm. Now, wait a minute. She's a federal judge, and this is a constitutional question. If she doesn't have jurisdiction, no one does. That's what they're doing, Alan. Any lawsuits brought against TSA or Homeland Security, the courts simply throw them out because why I would win and I would get the opportunity to go through discovery. They can't allow you to go through discovery, and they have a great fear if you win, it would open up a huge bag of worms. Yeah, so they so just they pass. Throw it out, and you can't. So people need to understand clearly, Alan, when you go to any airport in the United States, you are not protected by the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. In other words, they can do anything they want to you out there, and there's nowhere you can go to seek redress because the courts will simply throw it out. The new book, Demo Crips and Rebloodlicans, No More Gangs in Government. It's Jesse Ventura. When we come back, I'm going to ask you about running yourself and maybe some fears you have if you do run. Well, don't go away. Jesse Ventura is with us talking about his new book. And, of course, uh, you, if you should know, if you don't know, the former independent governor of Minnesota, former U.S. Navy SEAL, professional wrestler, movie actor, visiting fellow at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, New York Times bestselling author, and the host currently of True TV's Conspiracy Theory. We're going to be talking about some of those conspiracy theories in a bit. I, I heard in an interview that you have, yeah, you just are genuinely concerned that your life would be at risk if you ran for president. Did I hear that correctly? Well, I yeah, I think it would be. Do you think for one moment the powers in this, of these two parties and their, and their corporate donors 
would allow a rogue like me to get in there? I don't know if they. I don't. I don't know if I think they would uh, resort to violence. Well, they. Uh, in my opinion, they did on John F. Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Because I don't buy that Oswald acted alone. I've studied that murder for thirty years. It's ridiculous to believe that Lee Harvey Oswald did it. I even, uh, on one of my shows, we got the same weapon, the same bullets and everything, and I'm an expert marksman from being a Navy SEAL. You have to be, and I can still shoot. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it, and we didn't even have the targets moving. Mm -hmm. It took, the fastest I could work that bolt was eight and a half seconds. And they're claiming Oswald got off three shots and slightly over six. Accurate with a headshot on the third one. Well, your your first shot would be the most accurate, and that one he allegedly missed with. Mm-hmm. I mean, give me a break. Yeah, You're I, sitting there, you exhale. Your first shot's the most accurate. Not not working that bolt action and hitting the third one. Despite the fear and despite the reality of that, would you consider it under any well, condition? My major fear of running for president is my wife. Sure. Yeah. She, <laughs> no, she. Uh, she would oppose it in, I, I mean, and we've been married 37 years. I don't know what life would be without her. And I will always put my family before any political job, but let's put her, let's say she gave the blessing that I could do it. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I don't take any dirty money, so it would have to be a groundswell opportunity to do that. And the difficult thing, what the Democrats and Republicans have created, is that you have to get ballot access in every state. And get this, every state is different. Now, why should that be that way? Shouldn't it be a uniform thing in every state to qualify you to run for president? Yeah, sure, simplify things for everybody. Well, it should be. You're going for a federal office. What, what gets you on the ballot in Rhode Island should be the same in Arkansas or Oregon or wherever. But it's not. You have to jump through different hoops in every single state in order to get. And if you don't have ballot access in that state, mm-hmm. you're damn out of luck. There's no chance in hell. And so in order to do that would require you to raise large, large sums of money. Here's something I want, Alan, for you to know and the people to understand. When I ran for governor of Minnesota, I didn't take one cent of PAC money or special interest money. And in my four years as governor, I never met once with a lobbyist. Mm -hmm. Never. Now, having said that, I also only raised $300,000 to become the governor. I actually made more money doing the job because the governor's salary was $120,000 a year. That's $480,000 for four years. I bet I'm the only elected, major elected official who can state they spent less money to get the job. They got paid more doing, <laughs> doing the job than what they spent to get it. Absolutely, because you have the gift of getting the media's attention, and you don't have to buy it because you have the gift. Of, well, like I said, and, and, you, get, you get the stuff out of your mouth that people need to hear, and media, I think, is clamoring to have you say it. Well, the other reason was, to most politicians have to buy name recognition. I didn't have to do that in Minnesota. No. What would you do as president? Some of the things you wouldn't hesitate in in initiating? Well, the first thing I would do is I would close every base we have in a foreign country and bring our young men and women back home. Great. We don't need them. with, With the ability we have and the technology we have as a military, we can protect the United States of America without having six or eight bases in Japan, four or five bases in Germany, bases all over the globe. For what? How would we feel if, say, Hugo Chavez of Venezuela (laughs) came to Palm Springs and bought a thousand acres of desert land and moved the Venezuelan army in there? Yeah. Yeah. So there'd be outrage. We'd go to war over that. Yet we, the hypocrisy is unbelievable. Let me take it a step further. How about these unmanned drones? Let's say Hugo Chavez, because he fears the United States, which he should, let's say he bought an unmanned drone, he has the money, and he flew it over United States airspace and it crashed in our country. Oh my God. We would go to war against him for that. And yet we do that to Iran all the time. 
It seems it seems to me, and I agree with what you're saying totally. I mean, just having outsiders in your own land is going to provoke a lot of resentment. But the thing that always gets me going back to the economy, it was these two wars. It was going after Hussein that caused almost all of the financial problems we have. That was the genesis of where we are today economically. Absolutely, because George Bush didn't pay for it. He put it on the credit card. China. Borrow right. from China. That's when what that... we need to do. And I remember, you know, Ben Stein, that little guy with the glasses on TV. Yeah, we've had him on before. Okay, sure. I had an argument with him. I said, if we go to war, we should immediately implement a war tax. Because when you go to war, everyone should feel some pain. Absolutely. And, and Ben Stein said to me, that's ridiculous. In this economy, you want to raise taxes. I looked at him and I said, Ben, in other words, you want the young people to go fight the war, and then you want them to come home and have to pay for it afterwards? Mm -hmm. You're not even patriotic enough to pay for the war, let alone not fight it? Yeah, there has always been a war tax of some sort throughout our history. This is the first time no tax. Well, it was worse than that. We cut taxes. That's true. We did not only didn't raise them to go to war, we cut them. Jesse, this is, let me ask you this. Let, one more thing. If you were president. You oh, wait a minute. If I were president, you yeah. know the second thing I would yeah, do? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I would call up and have a meeting with Fidel Castro, and I would end the embargo of Cuba. I got in trouble. You know, Fox News banned me because I went on one time and said, you know, I don't understand why the people of the United States are so shocked that we would get attacked by terrorists because we've been practicing terrorism for 50 years. We just call it foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, I got all indignant with me. I forget who it was and said, give me an example. I said, how about Cuba? I said, Cuba has done nothing to us. The only thing they've done is they've put in a government we don't like. And I said, we've burned their cane fields, we've blown up ships in their harbor, we've attempted to assassinate their leader on multiple occasions, and here's the real good one. Do you know who Orlando Bosch was? Or is? Uh, you, the name rings a bell, forgive Look me for... on the internet. Okay. He put a bomb on a Cuban airliner that killed 73 civilians. Right, 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 right. Now, is that not an act of terrorism? Oh, absolutely. Okay, and he was pardoned by George Bush Sr., pardoned. He didn't even go to jail for blowing up a Cuban airliner with 73 individuals on it. That's not an act of terrorism. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. So if you're implementing these things, and you have a Congress doing to you what President Obama is dealing with, nothing he wants, they're going to let through. How would you deal with those obstacles of other politicians in Congress and the Senate? Well, what you have to have happen is the mistake that happened in Minnesota with the people. When the people elected me, all the people here took an attitude, ah, the big guy's in there, we don't have to pay attention anymore. It requires the people to stand with you. And that's what would be required. If the Congress wouldn't go along with what I wanted to do as president, it would require the United States people to email them, write them, telephone them, do whatever is necessary. Right. Because if they don't do that, the Democrats and Republicans won't listen. <laughs> and it has it, to come from the people that put them in office. I agree. And if you did that successfully, they'd say, oh, see, he's uh, manipulating the rules. He can't do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're going to take a quick break. As we continue with Jesse Ventura, one of the things that we haven't even had a chance to bring up is the, the great TV show, True TV's Conspiracy Theories and conspiracy theory, I should say. And, and the things that he brings up, the things that the government may be hiding from us, Jesse, if you would, talk about some of those things. And I'll start with extraterrestrial contact that possibly the government had at some point. Uh, what do you think the government is hiding? And is it possible they really don't know that much themselves? It's just, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we just make believe, we think they are because it's the government. They absolutely know. But before I do extraterrestrial, let me state something, Alan. Sure. We've been on two seasons now, eight shows a season. We finished our third season of eight shows in November, right on schedule. They mm -hmm. normally go on in January. Mm -hmm. They haven't been on, have they? 
You know, I haven't, my, my DVR didn't tape them. Yeah, I record, yeah, why? Well, they're sitting on them. I don't think we're going to see the last ones. And let me explain what happened on one. Yeah. One show, we, we delved into a certain subject. I won't say it in case they do go on TV. But we had an intern call this former colonel in the Army. And the Army said to the intern, don't you realize that people that look into this end up dead? Now, that's a threat. Wow. The intern quit my show, and I didn't blame her. She was 22 years old. She was going to get married. I didn't blame her. She said, I can't deal with this, so she quit. We continued and did the show. I brought in a, a whistleblower, a Dr. Fred Bell. Mm -hmm. When he got done doing what he was doing on the show off the record, he said to me, you know that I have a CIA handler, don't you? And I said, well, that doesn't surprise me with what you've worked on and what you know about. And then he quoted to me, he's going to go ballistic when he finds out I talk to you. Well, we put all our guests up in a hotel in Minneapolis. A day later, Dr. Fred Bell was found dead in his hotel. Oh, man. And we cover it on the show. How many shows are they sitting on? They're sitting on eight of them. Wow. You know, let me quickly tell you two stories. Uh, Dan Aykroyd was doing a show for the Sci-Fi Channel talking about uh, something to do with men in black, black, and he had a similar situation with an encounter that he explained on my show in detail uh, that was just unbelievable of, of, of something happening outside that intimidated him and made Sci-Fi cancel it. Another story, the Discovery Channel, Joshua P. Warren, who is a... Uh, kind of a paranormal expert they were doing a show in hd on some kind of a seance they were trying to contact an extraterrestrial and they made he said an amazing contact caught in hd producers were excited they couldn't believe what they got it was breathtaking and then all of a sudden discovery cancels the show never airs that segment and he well, that's i've got eight shows sitting right now We've had them done since November, our usual time schedule. Normally they go on in January, and uh, True TV has not aired them yet, and I don't know why. Uh, you know, it's very interesting, I think, because we probably crossed the line. These are the best eight shows yet. Wow. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, I can't answer why, why they haven't shown them. And the editing they're trying to do, they're trying to dumb the shows down real bad, hmm. and they're trying to make them, you know, look stupid. And I've voiced my concern, you know, saying, don't put my name on the show then, just call it conspiracy theory yeah. without Jesse Ventura's name on it, because if you're going to do that to it, I don't want to be part of it. I understand. I understand. So, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with the TV shows now, Alan. They're sitting there, and they're gathering dust, and... uh you know, whether they ever see the light of day, I don't know. Well, with the two minutes we have, we're going to continue this. Jesse's going to be back on in a week. As far as what you think the government knows about extraterrestrials and why President Obama, no president, is speaking about it. Well, I think that, uh, you know, I can't, you know, when I live in Mexico, uh, I live off the grid. And at nighttime, you can see the stars beyond belief. I can see shooting stars where they actually break into pieces like fireworks. And many times I'll look out on my deck at night and I'll look at this vast stars up there and I start laughing going, how can anyone believe that we're the only ones? Absolutely. How can anyone possibly think there's not other life form out there in this vast universe? There has to be. So having said that, do I know if we've been visited or not? I don't know. You know, I, I've never, I've never had any experience personally that I could state where, uh, you know, a, a UFO or something of that nature happened to me. But I'm certainly open-minded enough to realize that there, there has to be something beyond the earth. Well, Jesse, I'll tell you what, we're going to continue this. I really enjoyed it. Always amazing having you it's on. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Demo Crips and Rebloodlikens, No More Gangs and Government. The book is out. It's hot, getting great reviews. And the and website... Again, let me urge people, if you want to strike out against government right now, if you're frustrated, vote for Governor Gary Johnson, the libertarian candidate. Please, I can implore you to do so. And we ain't got time to bleed.com. We ain't got time to bleed.com. Talk to you next week, Jesse. Okay, Thanks again. I look forward to it. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye.